Why Jesus is the, is the title of this theme. And uh, as I was thinking about this, we, we thought peace would be one of the reasons for Jesus coming into the earth. And, and that's such, a, such an awesome topic. Uh, and it's more than a topic, it's a, it's a quality of life. It's a state of being. It's a condition of mind. It's a temperature of spirit. It is called serenity. It's tranquility on the inside. It's so that you could say, uh, when people say, how's life for you? You say, it's well, everything's good. I'm at peace. It's a, that'd be a rare thing for just about anybody to say in the world in which we live. And one of the reasons why this is such a good element of what Christ can bring into our world is because no one else can bring it. You can't get peace. You can't go down to a shop and buy it. You, you can't get peace with God any other way other than through Christ. And so why Jesus has, has in the backstory, why only Jesus? Why Jesus being the unique person He is who can bring unique qualities that all of us are searching for and looking in a thousand different places for? Why Jesus? Why do, you, why do you present Jesus? Because He is the one person who transforms a chaotic mindset, a turbulent heart into peacefulness. The devil can't give that. You can't get peacefulness out of a chaotic person. You can't get order and serenity and tranquility from a restless, uneasy, never-ending abyss of torment. You can't get it from there. Jesus is the only person in the universe who can put peace into that troubled mind, into that troubled heart. If you're watching online, some of you might be feeling there that, man, here I am in, in this difficult, isolated place. I'm telling you, if you can reach out to God in the middle of this sermon, in the middle of this message, you're gonna find peace comes into you. The Hebrews use the word shalom. For peace, but it means far, far more than just peace of mind. It means prosperity of your whole life. So when God invokes shalom on you, He is saying peace on your family, peace and blessing on your medical conditions, peace and healing to your emotions and to your broken heart. Peace and life comes into your world. When God came into this world, through Christ, He says, I've been anointed by the Holy Spirit to preach peace to those who are far off from God. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to bring deliverance to people who have troubled minds. And you know, we think sometimes that that's those people who are yet to receive Jesus. But I've met so many Christians who still haven't even begun to possess the things that God has got for them. That's why Paul said, I pray that the eyes of your inner man would be opened, that you would see what is the riches of what he has given to us. Because I think we've taken one step into the kingdom and most people stop there and say, whoa, I'm saved. And, and then fight all kinds of battles, struggle with all kinds of difficulties that you don't need to. If you would just take another step and possess the baptism of the Holy Spirit, take another step and possess of being crucified with Christ. Take another step and say, I'm forgiven permanently through the blood of Jesus and just keep possessing pieces of the land. Sometimes God will let you have a battle simply so that you'll get up and fight. Because when you start fighting, you exercise muscles that you wouldn't otherwise. And then you start to fight for a piece of the territory that you've never had to fight for. But now because you're living under a condemning spirit in your thinking, you think, I can't, I can't get close to God. I can't get anywhere near Him. But then you get a hold of a scripture like this, Romans 5 verse 1. It says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Man, you've got to love that verse. I love the tense that God speaks in. He speaks in past tense. Therefore, having been, it's in the past. I've been justified. So now I have peace. I have a permanent 
condition of peace because in the past, when I asked Jesus, I got justified. To be justified is sort of like, just as if I'd never sinned. It's like everything is blotted out. You are made right. Even when you were wrong, God calls you right. There's a scripture which is crazy. I mean, how amazing is grace? Too amazing to believe sometimes. Because he says he justifies the ungodly. And I have found myself sometimes feeling guilty about something. And the, and, and the Lord says, what are you doing? And I'm, I'm thinking, well, I'm kind of pleasing God a little bit by feeling bad about something I did that wasn't quite right. And he goes, what are you doing in guilt? I sent my son to take that guilt from you. And this is just plainly dishonouring to the sacrifice of that son of mine. If you hold on to something that I sent him to die for, would you let it go? And so when I sing the song, I surrender all, I'm not sort of thinking of, oh, I'm letting go something positive in my life so that I can just have something negative. Like, oh, I've got this nice home or whatever, and I'm just surrendering it over to you, Jesus. I guess I'll be in a caravan for the rest of my life. Uh, or, oh, Lord God, I got, this, I got this great job, but I surrender it so I can be a missionary to the, to the pygmies or something. You know, it's like, not that that'd be totally negative, but all I'm saying is that we sometimes think, I surrender all, I'm holding out on all the good stuff and, and so that God can get me to do the bad stuff. And, and that's not, not how I'm thinking of it at all. I'm thinking when I'm singing, I surrender all, I'm, I'm surrendering all my guilt so I can live justified because that will bring glory and honour to God. I'm surrendering all my negativity so that I can live in victory rather than just keep myself in a negative, self-pitying place, thinking that that is somehow a better place to be than to live in victory. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Peace is an outcome of faith. It's a result. It's a fruit. So when you start to believe, you start to get peaceful. Okay, 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 okay. This is kind of important. Sometimes we think peace is compromise. Like, if I can just reach a compromise, I can, if I can just accommodate and tolerate, then we all live at peace because you've got your position, I got my position, but let's just halve our positions and we, we kind of get into a peace. That never works. The, 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 the peace of accommodating. Look, okay, I'll just accommodate for this problem in my life. Devil, will you leave me alone if I just stop? Okay. It's not, it's not going to happen. The peace that God brings is because <laughs> He has completely crushed the enemy. <clears throat> In Romans 16, I think it's verse 20, He says, God will soon, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. He is the God of peace because the one trying to create the war is completely defeated. No compromise, no terms of agreement, no toleration, no accommodation, a complete victory. Don't get nervous about words like war and crushing and, and all of that. God's a man of war and Christianity needs to be a whole lot more masculine in Jesus' name. We need to know that we are in a fight. And, and you have weapons. This is how I fight my man. How do, you, how do you fight your battles? You fight them with the one idea in mind and that is to win. So, so even when you're walking through and you feel like, oh, I can't go on. I'm going to give up. Oh, my mind's going to collapse. My emotions are all over the place. How am I ever? Just keep walking. That's your fight to take another step. Come on. Keep walking. You think, oh, no, God's against me. I'm so guilty. No, take another step. You haven't quite gotten that full enlightenment of justification in there, but you will do as you keep the battle. Because as you make a decision to make, take another step, God will empower you. He will empower you to walk through your valley. The power comes when you take a step. It, uh, it, it, God cooperates with us and we cooperate with God. We move together. He needs your decision to empower you. And as you keep making that decision, He's going to keep on empowering you. Man, this is good. You know, the, 
the, the fact is, is that the, the Bible says there's not going to be any peace at all to the wicked. And, and as, long, as long as we stay in the place of being one of the wicked, I'm sorry, no peace is coming. And, and as I said before, the message of the gospel didn't just come to people who were, who were outside the kingdom. When Jesus said, you must be born again, it wasn't to a person who was far off from God. It was said to a person who was meant to be quite close to God. His name was Nicodemus. He was, he was like a, a religious leader. And Jesus said to him, Nicodemus, you've got to be born again. And, and so Nicodemus started a journey and it travels through Scripture. You see him later on. He actually gets born again. And, and there are moments in our, in our journey with God, if we don't deal properly with a moment where we stumble, we're going to find ourselves ill at ease, still troubled on the inside. And the difference is, let, let me say this to you, the difference is whether we repent or defend ourselves. If we defend our position and, and, and we're convicted uh, about something we did and we go, well, you don't understand my circumstances I, I, and you've justified yourself in a negative position. But the moment you say, okay, I repent from that. That's the first thing. I confess it and I forsake it. Those three things, that's all you got to do. That's all you got to do. And if I only had one message in the universe, in the whole world to preach, it would be that. Because once a person makes that decision to not defend their position, but saying, I am going to repent from that, I'm going to confess it and turn from it, then the blood of Christ and the justifying power of God is going to reach you and peace comes to that troubled heart. I can't give it to you any other way. That's called salvation. That's called healing. That's, that's called, but if, if I defend my position, no, 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 you don't understand. Uh, my parents, you know, my, oh, you don't know my background. Oh, all the things that just explain and justify and solidify me in this position. There's no, I, I, I can't, I can never stop doing this. I'm just stuck with this condition. And I don't see it as a sin. I see it as a somehow sickness. Now I've, I've di- misdiagnosed it. I've covered it up. I've camouflaged it. Now I'm going to be living in dispeace because I'm troubled about my life. But listen to me. If you would, oh, if I could just get in front of every human being on the planet and beg them, just say, God, I'm sorry. Just say, I repent. Just say, I, I confess it. I'm, I'm guilty. I'm not going to blame anybody else. I'm not going to blame the government, parents, church, anything. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Then God will pour, pour grace into my life. Pour power and healing. He will pour it into you, justify you. And peace comes. A peace you never knew was possible to have. It's like, it's like you don't know how thirsty you are until you start drinking a drink. And then you can't stop. You go, and, you, and your brain goes, yeah, I'm, I'm really thirsty. And you, you drink the whole bottle. Anybody ever done that? Yeah. Well, that's like this piece. You don't know how aching the soul is for that rest until you taste it. And when that comes, you know that you've met God because peace is His signature. The devil can't leave it. No human can leave it. Jesus said, my peace I give to you. And that peace is wholeness of thinking, wholeness of heart. It is, it is mental health. It is emotional health in the inside of your life. You know, uh, there's so many things I could say about this. And you know, when I started this message, I thought to myself, I think I've written a book about this. And... Uh, I rang up somebody. I said, did I write a book about peace? They said, yeah, you did. And so here it is. Yeah, you can get it out there. Uh, and I, I'd forgotten, you know, age, right? Uh, but there's the, 
there's too much for me to cover in, in one 30-minute sermon about this. But I would urge you to get a hold of this because I, I talk about a whole wide range of areas to do with the peace of God. I mean, that Jesus even talks about the normal little worries we have. I, I just, I love God so very much because He gets involved in things like talking to you about what you eat. He says, why are you worried about what you eat? Gluten's not going to upset you that much, amen. Five years ago, fat was bad. I read the other day, it's good. Ten years ago, cholesterol levels were, oh, they're all the rage like you're going to have a heart attack. Now, it means nothing apparently. I don't know. I don't know what to believe. These guys change their minds. When I was young, the earth was like 3 billion years old. Now it's 150 billion years old. I mean, yeah, I guess you can just change your mind when, if, you, if, you, if your commercial product isn't matching up with your science. I, I don't know what, what motivates all the changes. I have new research and experts in here. And Jesus, don't, what are you worried about? It? What are you worried about your clothes for? He says, don't worry about what you wear. God will look after you. He says, don't even worry about your height. Can you imagine? Here's the Son of God come from heaven, and He knows that you worry about how tall you are. So He says, don't worry about your height. Wear, wear high heels. Put some stilettos on. Even the woman could, you know? I mean, uh, whoops, yeah, okay. You know, the, here's Jesus addressing your world of worry, and He says, please stop worrying. Just stop. That would be, to you that feels, I, I can't do that. What would I do if I didn't worry? You could pray. Really? Uh, yeah, well, why pray when you can worry? I mean, listen to me. Worms are going to eat you when you're dead. Worry eats you while you're alive. Same vibe. You are getting eaten up on the inside by a thing called worry. And in, in the New Testament, you got this, this couple of people who are just brilliant contrast, two sisters, Luke 10, 38. As they went into a certain village, a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. Now I'm going to pray for people in about six, seven minutes for peace to come to your mind. God says, my presence will go with you and I will give you peace. You know God is with you when you feel peace come upon you. You know, when I was a kid and I would have a nightmare, I don't know about you, but I'd go down the hallway, climb into my parents' bed, and now I could go to sleep. What is that? It's the presence of a bigger person, of a father, of a mother, of, of someone else just there. When you, this morning, go up the hallway and climb into dad's bed and the father's there to say, hey, I'm here for you. Rest. Have some sleep. You might think having a sea change or having a holiday or buying a house in, in, in the forest is going to give you peace. It might give you a certain kind of peace in the outside world, but in here, the real turmoil is something that cannot be, cannot be purchased or arranged through a change. It is something that comes through His presence, taking up residence in your heart. And that's why we need to spend time with him this Tuesday night, seven o'clock. Be here just to spend time, 55 minutes in the presence of the Lord. And then at Presence Conference, if you haven't signed up, be in there. It's when, when you receive a peace from God, you would, anybody would say there is nothing on earth worth sacrificing this for. There is nothing in the, in the universe that I, would, that I would give an exchange for this peace. Because this peace puts you all together. 
But we live without it in a distracted age. We live without it in so many anxious moments. Luke 10, 38, they entered a certain village. A woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. She had a sister called Mary, sat at Jesus' feet, heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to Martha, Martha, you're worried and troubled about so many things. But one thing is needed. Mary's chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. Martha's, Martha's the kind of girl who, who dusts the cheese in the fridge because everything just has to be perfect. She's got plastic on the couch. You know that? Uh, it's to take your shoes off at the door. It's, it's, that's her house. And... And Mary, her sister's a hippie. She's a spirit dancer. She's just like, ah, oh, I love Jesus. He's so amazing. She, she's got braids and beads and tattoos and, you know, like plays the acoustic guitar. So they're, they're kind of not really similar. Uh, Martha has a schedule every day for, you eat mints on Wednesdays, you have sausages on Saturdays. I mean, it's just, it's all laid out. She sees as she looks out the window, Jesus coming over the hill. And, and Jesus never travels alone. He's got about 70 people with him. He's got his entourage. He's, he's on an evangelistic campaign. Here he comes, walking down. This is the house he stays at. Martha sees it. She goes, no. She, oh God, no, he didn't let me know. There was no text message. Did you get it? No. I so she's, she just goes crazy. She rushes out to the garage. In her mind, she does a quick project sequence management sheet. And she gets, yeah, get the tables out, get the potatoes on, get the... Uh, so she, so she, with it, she's got it all happening. She's rolling out round tables, putting up the trestles, putting up the table, going out. She's like lightning, man. She's moving so quick. Rushes up the stairs, puts her hair in curlers. It's curlers days. And uh, apron. And uh, of course, she's got a nice little dress on. And she's got her flats on until, she, until he arrives. Then she'll put her heels on. So she's running, rushing up and down. And, and she, she goes out of the kitchen, peels 100 potatoes in like five minutes. And uh, he looks out the window. He's nearly here, no. And she's got the piece. She goes into the, into the refrigerator, gets in the freezer, pulls out a turkey, pulls out a chicken, pulls out a ham, which is pretty liberated for Jewish people, and pulls out, you know, uh, she's getting all this stuff, throwing it in, into the microwave. It's got three microwaves. Got, there. I go, and she's going, oh, God, now get the gravy. Get the, and the steam's coming out of the kitchen, and she's rushing out now, getting white linen tablecloths, putting them all on the tables. They are getting all the cutlery. She's fast, this girl. She's getting to servants. She's yelling and screaming at servants. And she's going, whoa, whoa, whoa. like this. It's like street lightning. You can't even see her. Whoa, whoa. So then she's doing one of these rushes from. Whoa. She looks around. And there's a hippie sister. <laughs> playing the guitar. <laughs> sitting at the feet of Jesus. And she's just, I love you, Jesus. This is how I fight my battle. I surrender. You know when you're working hard and somebody who should be helping you is not helping you? How your attitude just stays so wonderful? <laughs> Poor thing. No, it goes south quickly. You're in the, you're in the deep black abyss. You're in the pit. You're going, what the? And you say a word you shouldn't say in church, you know? Is she doing there? So, she's got this troubled head that just makes her hate her sister. And she says, do you, but do, do you think, here's the point. Do you think she's going to talk to her sister about her? No. Her attitude has not only gone south about a sister, it's gone deep south about Jesus himself. Do you not care? Don't you love me, God? Why don't you send people to help me do this thing? God, why didn't why didn't the church get behind me? God, why doesn't why didn't Pastor Phil think about you know, doing that? God, why doesn't why doesn't now the Christian do that? Why why don't why don't people do what I want them to do? Because <laughs> you're not God. <laughs> 
we're all committed to doing what He wants us to do. And if we're smart, we'll flow in with Him. But she is upset because she's working so hard. Now, a works-based Christianity is always going to end up with a very bad attitude towards God. Performance-based living is going to end up with a, bad, with a bad attitude. You're better to enter into the grace of God and live by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit rather than force your life, flow your life. Moving with God is not forcing things, it's flowing. Learn to flow with that river, that life of the Holy Spirit. Keep yourself in the riverbanks of that river and you're gonna find yourself empowered. So by this time, half her curlers have fallen out. The mascara, you know, she's got smears of gravy and potato and Ding, ding, the, the, the turkey's gone off over there in the microwave. This steam galore filling the house, coming out of all the boiling potatoes. And he says, Martha, Martha. When he repeats your name, people, <laughs> it's not going to be good. Duck, Martha, Martha, you're so troubled about so many things. Mary's chosen the good thing. She's just in the, in the house worshiping. She's, she's gone to presence conference, baby, you know. I know you thought you couldn't have the time. But maybe all that kind of thing. We're going to get some help. Maybe if you just go down there and sit. Yeah, but what about my kids? I don't have money. I don't have money. At the world, I'm here. I'll look after you. Yeah, I don't know if you really will. Turn your faith on. Connect with the power. He says, Martha, Martha, you're so distracted. Distraction is a, is a bad way to live, people. You're only half living, if that. You know, when you're in a meeting and everybody's on their phones or something, you feel like nobody's really there. They're only half there. That's how God feels when we come into the house and we're distracted. In our heads, we're... On our, he's saying, with all your heart, with all your soul, in an undistracted manner, come into my presence. I'd love to spend some time with you. He says, Martha, Martha, you know, a cup of tea and a piece of toast will be fine. She starts crying. The mascara is all the way down her apron. She's hair's in a mess, you know, and she's just feeling like now a little silly. But I can guarantee you that Jesus just hugged her right there and held her quivering little frame until she just calmed right down. And then he gave her a guitar. <laughs> and said, sit down with your sister and let's just have peace. I want you to be a peaceful person, not to rush through life, but to walk through your world with a, a heart for God and a peaceful mind. Lord Jesus, here today, I pray for every one of our people that the peace of God that passes all understanding, that keeps our hearts and minds, will come into our world. Father, that as we spend time in your presence, we'll know why Jesus because he's the only one who could bring peace to the human race. And all the reason for the strife without is because of the strife within. And I'm praying that, Lord God, we'd be able to be healed of the strife within so that the climate of contention and conflict all around us would cease. You make wars to cease. Be still and know that I am God. You know, while I'm standing here, there may be some of you who maybe not, never been to church, maybe have, but maybe you never prayed a prayer inviting this person, Jesus, the Prince of Peace, to come into your life. In a couple of moments, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and we'll pray for you. Uh, there could be people here today who are afar off from God. 
you have defended your position and you found yourself distant from the Lord and away from the house of God. And I want you to come back. I want you to return to Him today. So I'm, also, I'm going to ask you also to raise your hand. There could be people like Nicodemus who come to church, but they're not sure if they're going to heaven. We, we do the religious church thing, but we're not just sure about whether or not we're going to be in heaven when, when that time arrives. So right now, while every eye is closed, while we're just in this presence of the peace of God. I want to know that if you have never prayed that prayer, saying, Jesus, come into my life, or if you've been away from God and you need to come back, or if you're just not sure you're going to heaven, right now, wherever you are in this meeting, if that's you, would you put your hand up, please, for me? Raise it high, and we'll pray for you here today. Thank you. Who else is there? Thank you. Thank you. Who else is there? Thank you. Thank you. Who else is there? Would you raise your hand, please? Just raise it high. There's about four, five people right now who've raised their hand. Anybody else at all? Thank you, sir. I see your hand. Thank you. I see you. Oh, yeah, up the back. Thank you. See your hand. Who else is there? If there's one more person, I'm going to ask you to uh, raise your hand before I close and we're going to pray. The reason I ask you to raise your hand is that I want to give you something at the end of the service and our assistants can see your hand and they will deliver a little uh, Bible to you to help you start this journey following Jesus. Can I ask everybody to stand right now? And uh, we're going to pray a prayer together. And those four to five people who raise their hands, I want you to pray this prayer as well. Along with us. Make sure that you make it your prayer. And talk to God. Can you say these words together with me now? Dear God in heaven, I receive Christ as my Savior. I will follow you, Jesus. Make me your child. Help me follow you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Father, I praise you. Give the Lord a clap offering, everybody. Okay. Okay, so, so now, if you are troubled in your world about a circumstance of some kind, Oh, my heart, my heart feels that. It feels heavy. There are people carrying burdens you should not be carrying in here. It's time for you to let them go. Something good is going to happen to you. You don't have to carry that burden. You somehow, you haven't forgiven yourself. God has forgiven you and you've heard that message and you kind of believe it, but you're not prepared to forgive yourself. Now's the time. Forgive yourself. So I'm going to stop roasting myself over what I did. It's time to let it go. And you know, for some of you, it's almost like, and this is very bad theology. And so I'm saying it's like, it's not as it is. But some of you need to forgive God. Not that He needs any forgiving. That's why I'm saying it's not good theology. But you are accusing Him of certain things, then you got to let it go. you got to let it go. you got, you got to stop saying, if, only, if, he had, if, if He had helped me, if He had only stop it. Just let it go. Repent from it. Say, I'm sorry, God. I'm blaming you for stuff I should have done or things that were out of my control. Or I, things I do not understand. When you don't understand it, move into trust. Trust God. He is good and He loves you. And His power is here to bring healing and peace into your world. So if you need peace in your life, you're living in a troubled world, right now, reach out to God. I'm going to pray for His peace to supernaturally overwhelm every piece of turbulence in your life. Heavenly Father, right now, I pray for the peace of God, which passes all understanding to enter the hearts and minds, into the relationships of the marriages and the families into the friendships, into the circumstances, into the medical conditions. I'm praying for shalom, that complete wholeness and peace of God right here, right now. Lord, bring the miraculous breakthrough of the power of Your Spirit into every life here in Jesus' Name. And everybody said, Amen. Come on, give the Lord a great clap offering. Thank you.